Good evening. I got two questions for you. What is your dream? Tell me about it. And number two, what can we do to help it come true? Isn't that nice to hear somebody say that to you? Because indeed, we're going to approach that subject tonight and a whole lot more. I want to welcome you uh, to a webinar that's sponsored by the uh, community college system, small business centers. Tonight, we're going to be talking about different employee retention strategies. I'm looking forward to getting into it with you. My name is Steve Carver. Uh, we're uh, meeting together at my office, home office and studio in Dunn, North Carolina. And this is my presentation number 1007 and 1008 tonight, as it's a two-part presentation. Uh, we do a lot of work in webinars, and so glad to see all of y'all uh, with us tonight and hope that you'll come back for many, many more. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not an accountant. Uh, I am not a CPA. I'm a fellow that's been in business, uh, different types of businesses, for uh, 63 years. A lot of them have been successful thus far. I've been able to sell a few through the years. Our businesses has never written a bad check. And today I'm very active in our internet business, which is a continuation of a farm equipment business that we operated for 51 years. So I'm not just someone that's read a book and gonna talk to you about it tonight, even though I did read a book and I'm gonna talk to you about it tonight, but I am someone that's been in business uh, for a long time and still in it today, very active in a retail and internet sales business. I have a uh, customer base of over 4,000 customers. I've probably had over 2,500 employees through the years. So I'm talking from experience and stuff that I've learned on my own and under the uh, coaching of other coaches, as well as uh, all the entrepreneurs that have shared with us through the years in these classes. So my first piece of advice to you is always get a second or third opinion before you make a serious decision affecting the security or stability of your finances or your business. And one of the very best places you can go to find a good place to get uh, second and third opinions or the small business centers at the community colleges near you. Uh, we're sponsored tonight by the one at James Brunt Community College in Kenansville, North Carolina, <clears throat> where Mr. John Hardison is the director. He's a CPA and an excellent advice giver. Uh, so if you're interested in setting up an appointment with him, he'd be very, very happy to talk with you. If you'd like for me to help you get set up with a small business center more near you than Kenansville, I'll be glad to do that. All you have to do is just drop me an email or let me know in chat and the ball will be in my court. But John is available to you and uh, his uh, information is in your handout and also uh, on the screen here. Uh, this record, this uh, session will be recorded tonight, so you'll be able to refer back to any of these slides on your own. Use them as you'd like. Uh, they're here to serve you, and I'm glad to share it with you. Uh, next Tuesday night, we'll finish up our series of five, se five sessions. Next Tuesday night, we're going to be talking about how to set prices for your services or your products and also tips on how to conquer competition. Uh, both of these have been very popular uh, lessons through the years, and I'll be glad to share them with you. Then starting in January, we'll take a little break from Thanksgiving over to January, and uh, you know, I think it's on January the 8th, we'll start a, a new series of classes. The fourth, first one is a 14-hour class. We'll go seven Wednesday nights, six to eight, uh, covering pretty much seven different core series subjects of how to start a business where you will be entertained and introduced to approximately three or 400 ideas and strategies. Uh, it's been well attended through the years. We'd love for you to attend us and we'll go steady if you'd like to for seven Wednesday nights. And at the end of the time, I think you'll be very, very pleased with how much you've learned uh, to help you in your business, whether you're already in business or not. It's really good. And we have a lot of, uh, regular uh, attendees who come back in uh, year after year, session after session, because there's just so much information in each session, you just can't take, get it all in at one time. And it takes a while to get your business started, so we're welcome to have you come back as many times as you'd like. Then after we do those first seven, we'll do a session just like we 
winding up now another five Wednesday nights for a 10-hour series on special subjects like we're talking about tonight. So I uh, hope you enjoy tonight and next Tuesday and plan to kick right back in with us in January. And as you do that, uh, you will have you'll make a lot more money and have a lot less stress. Uh, also, one of your handouts tonight are the 40 Street Smart Drill Skills, where I give you some uh, really good ideas, uh, learning lessons on uh, how to build your business, jumpstart your sales. Uh, it's available to you. I'd encourage you to look at each and every one of them, try to make them a part of your DNA, and indeed, you'll find it be quite helpful. Tonight's topic is uh, focused on employee retention. Because one of the most biggest expenses in any business, whether you're doing home health care or whether you're hiring truck drivers to help you uh, in a trucking business, one of the biggest expenses that we always have is employee turnover and training. Because employees that are not trained, that are not happy, they cost you money uh, and sometimes cost you a whole lot more than you ever realize. So, when you do have good employees and you're able to train them, it is important that you know how to keep them. Uh, that was a challenge uh, for me when I owned businesses that had lots of employees. Uh, over the years, my dad was a great teacher. He was a great friend of employees and uh, kept employees for the long term. And I'm very fortunate in uh, following his lead and his teaching. I was able to pick up a lot of great ideas to, for employee retention. <clears throat> learning lessons, life lessons, and I'm glad to share those with you tonight. So we'll be moving along. So first topic is how do we find and hire and keep those great employees? The, it's a, a, a subject that we'll get right into now. But the first question is a question for you, uh, basically on what your feelings are, because until you have kind of settled down who you are and what you're looking for, this, you're, you're not ready to hire people for the long term. So what are the most important values to you when you're looking for an employee? When you're doing jobs and you're getting ready to do a project, when you're trying to motivate yourself, what values are important to you? Do you have a set of uh, mission statements and vision statements and core values for your particular company? If you don't, I want to suggest that you do that because it will really help you when you start addressing the subject. And this is a good time to say that through tonight I'll be mentioning opportunities for me to be able to send you study guides and information. And this is the first one. I've got a really good study guide to show you how to uh, uh, get into writing your mission, vision, and promise statement and selecting your core values so that you can express your internal uh, feelings about running a business, and it will really help you every day in doing that. So if you'd like for me to send that study guide to you, I'll just mention in chat to uh, to do that. Make sure I have your email address. Uh, Kalen, uh, uh, let's see, Kalen, I see I don't have your email address on the screen. Uh, I do see that you have already put it in chat, so that's great. I'll be able to send it to you. Thank you very much. So kind of what we have to do is a personal evaluation determine what those values are and put them on a scale and it's good for us to do that for ourselves and our own feelings before we start interviewing employees or thinking about the employees that we're after so that when we do have a chance to do that interview and work with them you'll be able to rate you'll be able to rate where they stand on your your scale of values uh, so that when you're comparing them with your other uh, applications, you'll be able to make a decision uh, based on on facts instead of something that just feels good. So that's this important thing to do. So in your handout and here on the screen, I've listed down uh, traits, uh, value traits that will come into play whenever you're uh, thinking about hiring an employee. From trustworthiness to steadfastness, stamina, communications, persuasive, can they sell, competitiveness, leadership, motivational, inspirational, business skills, and management. Let's say that all these uh, points right here could get a 10-point grade. 
So you you can assign your own values for for the grade values. But if we had a 10 points for each one of these, if someone got a 120 on a score, that'd be 100 percent. That'd be as good as you could get. So we certainly will find it hard to think anyone can be as good as it gets because we all have a little thing we can improve on. But that's a, a good type of scale to do. I've used this through the years, and it's been very, very helpful when uh, thinking about hiring people. So figure out your own chart and what's important to you. This is here as, as an example. So are you ready to hire your first employee, or are you ready to explain, expand your current team? It's a fact that all of us may start out as one one person shows, but as we grow our business, as we grow our business, we're going to have to, uh, in 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 some way, uh, give other people the options and the directions to uh, to take care of, of, of things. We're going to have to direct them to do other things, assign them duties, and such as that. And you are you ready to do that? Uh, that's a question that some of us oftentimes have to ask. Also, from the other standpoint, and uh, are are you going to be the type of employee like many of us will be working for other people and also running our business too, maybe doing several part-time jobs? The lessons learned here are: what are other employers looking at me? How are they judging me? And I'll assure you that if they've been to any classes in this type of stuff. They'll be using some of the same guidelines that you and I are using tonight. So this may be a mirror for you to improve your situations, maybe in a permanent job that you already have. I'd like to uh, take a note here that Sarita has joined us. It's good to have you on board, Sarita. And, and uh, Tari, it's good to have you on board as well. So let's talk about setting some standards for ourselves before we could expect some employees to to do that. We as individuals, as owners of our business, have to set certain standards of hospitality and excellence. If, we're, if, we, if we don't have our standards set, there's no way that we can pick and choose uh, possible employees for the future. And a real popular thing in the USA industry world and in small business today is what's being called a plus one management style plus one management style. There's a lot of different management styles that, you're, that you'll hear about. I'm a walk-around manager. Uh, I do this or I do that or whatever, but something that's becoming really important uh, and popular uh, for entrepreneurs is the plus one style of management. Let's get into that just a little bit. It, it's kind of like you have to own this style yourself. In other words, you're setting your own uh, brand your own way of doing things so that uh, you feel good about how you're running your business. And that's important because how can an employee know if they're meeting your expectations if you're not setting an example that's good and steady that they'll know what they're looking for in a, in a regular way? Heidi, in your work, this is going to be so important. And you said that you have some uh, history in this field. Plus one management styles is used by a lot of folks in the home health care business uh, as it's uh, one that we can stay with. And it's so important as you will uh, grow in your business and have so many different employees that come and go, depending on who your clients are, uh, your management style will have everything to do with your ability to keep them and have them keep coming back. So what does it mean, that plus one style? One, setting service of sta uh, setting standards of general service of hospitality and what is hospitality that is the way people feel about doing business with you it's not your customer service standards it's how folks feel about doing business with you then you have to learn how to establish boundaries and i like to say having room for your employees to be themselves. You can't clone people. You don't want to clone people. But let people be their self and do the best they can do, but they need to stay within the boundaries that you set up. And I like to call that the, the riverbanks. Yeah, flow on down the river, but stay in the stream. Don't get outside these riverbanks. So setting boundaries is important. And always being ready and willing 
to raise your standards up to the next uh, level. Always be willing to find a way to improve what you're doing. It just uh, will help you in so many, so many different ways. Uh, welcome, Patrice. Glad to have you on board tonight. I hope you enjoy. We're talking about how to uh, find, keep, and and um, and hire the greatest employees. So I'm sure you're going to be needing this lesson down the road. <clears throat> One of the styles that uh, that we do that we have to remember is that service is a, a good manager, a good business owner, a good, great entrepreneur will learn uh, to always have gentle and continuing pressure genuine and continuing pressure to show employees that you're going to maintain your standards. It's doing things every day the certain way to, to, uh, to be stable, to, to give a, a solid rock image to your employees so that they can identify with you and better understand what, what you want done. You have to manually demonstrate things that you want to be done with, with your daily actions, uh, with your behavior, Examples, posture, attitude, great big smile, the way you welcome folks, just keeping a good standard and being yourself. In other words, not going all over the map uh, in the way that you run your business. I like to use an example of uh, continuing in general pressure. Uh, I think y'all might identify with this. Uh, uh, talking about uh, owner uh, of a restaurant, a small restaurant. Let's say that we're talking about a white tablecloth restaurant or, or polished wood table restaurant where that uh, when guests come in, everything is set up. Now, it may not be as elaborate as in this picture, but things are already set up. The knives and forks, the, the, uh, the beverage uh, uh, glasses, napkins, plates. There is a standard there that you can expect every time you go into this steakhouse, so to speak, or a fish house. Uh, when you walk in there as a customer, you know, because you've been there several times before, that the owner of this place, the manager of this uh, business, has set a standard that you can depend on. And how important is that for repeat business? Well, if it's a good standard, it is a huge important factor that customers know that when they come to this place, they're going to be treated in a certain way. Uh, the highest... Uh, 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 grades for this type of uh, active uh, continuing pressure in the fast food industry, if you want to call it fast food, uh, would be uh, Red Lobster and, and uh, an Outback Steakhouse, which is owned by the same management team, I'm told. They maintain a standard every time they get a chance. All their employees are trained to give certain answers, to act a certain way, to, to, to be steady on their feet and, and know that they've got the backing of the management. So when you see when you see a manager walking around uh, resetting things on the table, the owner of the restaurant or the, or the night manager is going over to, to empty tables and moving the salt shaker here or putting something else just in the right place. What is the message that he's sending? What is the message that she is sending when she makes small adjustments? The message is, I'm going to have continuing, silent, but very definite pressure on myself to maintain standards in this restaurant. Now, whoever set that table up is over in the corner or walking by watching the manager kind of redo some things that he or she had just set up. Is that a bad message for the manager to be sending to that employee? Well, some might think it is. He's just anal. He's just carrying this thing way too far. But no. Papo Stevo is here to tell you that that manager is showing that employee we're going to do everything it takes to take it up to the next bar. Now, that same person who maybe made some adjustment, that same manager is the one that would go by that employee and say, Man, that table looked great. You did a great job on it. You did a great job on it. So he, he's going to apply the pressure to keep doing the great job by showing physically that he's looking over their shoulders all the time. Now, over on the other side of the room, there's other employees that's watching him do this, and they're getting the same message. 
he wants this place just right. So if I'm going to please him and, and, and stay up with the standards, then I've got to follow the lead to the, to the nth degree to make this table look perfect for our customers. Now, who else is in consideration here? It's the customers who have either just come in or are already sat down dining. They're sitting there eating, and right over on the next table, the owner of the restaurant, the manager of the restaurant that night is making these adjustments, and they're watching him. And one looks over to the other and says, what in the world is he doing? That table was perfect. And the other customer may just say this, and if it was me, here's what I'd say. He is offering continuous, silent pressure to show his, his customers and his team that high standards are going to be maintained here so that you're always going to get the very best when you come in. Now, whether you didn't like the feeling that maybe he was being anal and carrying it too far or not, you'll still be impressed with the fact that the standards are high and he's willing to go the extra mile to see that happen. And my friends, that is a good thing in today's world because how often do you see this happening? Not so much. And these same types of activities can apply to every type of business. Whether you're uh, uh, doing design work or printing work or, or, or travel agency work, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, these same types of pressure uh, points where that you redo things and do them just right and you do the proofreading and you make the, the smallest errors, you correct the smallest errors, that goes a long way with number one, how you feel about your management skill, that plus one. Number two, how your employees will feel about it. But more importantly, you will be setting the standards for your customers to go out and tell the world this is a good place to go because that manager with his plus one style is making sure we're going to have a great, great dinner. So training your staff to deliver soul, service with soul is important because that is the hospitality standpoint. How the customers feel, listen to what those employees are saying, and listen to what those customers are saying. Here's, a, here, here's kind of a little bit of magic. How do you maintain and keep great customers? requires pretty much the same actions as how do you maintain and keep uh, repeat customers coming back. You care about how they feel. You care about what they're saying to you, and you're always ready to come back with a thoughtful, gracious, and appropriate response. That's right. That's when we're dealing with our customers. Come back with that appropriate response. What, what do you mean, Steve? Well, here's a little, just a little example. In today's world, a lot of young folks are, 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 are interested in saying, when I would say to, to a, a, a wait person at a, a restaurant, uh, I really appreciate that great service that you are giving us today. And thank you very much. I, I'm going to give you a nice tip. And the response that you're liable to get is, no problem, no problem. In other words, they're making light of the compliment that you just gave them. Well, I want to tell you that is an inappropriate response for an employee to give because it is a problem if someone says, no problem, because the more correct response would be, well, thank you very much. We are, it's a pleasure to serve you. In other words, I recognize that you're compliment, and we deserve that compliment, and I want to say it is a pleasure for us to, do, to give you excellent service in a very quick, nice, comfortable way. Thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that. We're, we're glad that you enjoyed your time here, and we hope you'll come back. That's an appropriate response. No problem is a bad response. It is a, there is a problem there. That's the difference in taking it to the next level. Management with soul makes you care about the way the employees feel. It makes you care about what they're saying to you and you will give the gracious uh, appropriate responses and you will need to get used to it early on. Think about what you're saying because you know what as owners and entrepreneurs and just human beings it's very easy for us to say well at, in my business I'm going to be myself. I'm not going to put on any show. I'm just going to be myself, and if I come out 
uh, uh, rough or gruff or, or or hateful or a snappy answer or abrupt, as a lot of people have to say I am at times, then I'm making a mistake. Because you don't have the luxury with employees of being yourself sometimes. You do have the responsibility with employees to maintain a plus one management style, even if it means that you start changing your character and your responses to remember. It's really important that you give someone a thoughtful and gracious answer. It's really important that we don't be abrupt because we're dealing with our assets of our business and our friends and our life and our customers. The, the employees are just as much and probably a greater asset than your customers are because they're the ones that are going to help you bring back in more customers. That, see the difference, what I'm saying in mindset? Yeah, we're the boss. We're the, we're the uh, uh, taskmaster. We can tell other people what to do. We have that authority and power over folks. When you think like that, I can tell you, you are on the way to not keeping the very best employees. We have to remember to do things right. Now, we're human, and we'll get angry sometimes, and people will disappoint us, and we might fly off the handle. Hey, I, I'm one that's apt to do that. But I have learned through the years, a little bit of wisdom can creep into someone whether he wanted to or not. It is so much better to try to maintain your responses in a thoughtful, gracious, and appropriate way that will lead to a better relationship with your employee. Try to remember that. What we have to do is now is think about uh, talking with folks about coming to work with us. And I want you to know that, yeah, you can sit down and have a chit-chat over coffee. You can get a feel for where they went to school and what they like and this and that, maybe what their skills are, their other experiences. But there is no substitute for a written application. No substitute for it for the quality that you're going to be able to find in your employee. Because that application means that you have given the time to set down in words questions that will help you find out where these people are on that scale that we talked about earlier. You want to have some questions that require a narrative response sometimes. You want to have some questions that re require them to fill in the blanks at times. You want to mention your company policy and, and vacation things and things like that to get a little response back from them. Your application cannot be too long. Nope. You may get tired of writing page after page, but Papo Stevo is going to tell you here that your application for an employer, employee cannot be too long. It can be too short because it won't get you the information you need. But as long as you're staying legal, you, have, you make it as long as you feel like you need to do because it's going to be very, very important for you, and you'll see why as we go on. The three keys in hiring are can, will, and fit. When I sit down with an employee, when I'm, when I'm thinking about hiring uh, Patrice, uh, when I'm thinking about hiring Heidi, the very moment we sit down and we're having our narrative, chit-chat talking, I'm, I've, I've, I've got my pad here, and I've written down beside the application, can, will, fit. And I'm going to determine, before I make a decision about this employee, can, will, fit. Can. Do they have the ability and the smarts to do what needs to be done? I need to know that. And I need to ask the questions that help me determine that. That's why that application may have some uh, some places for them to fill in the blanks. Can do they? Is there a light bulb up there that comes on and off? Uh, in that tray of pencils, where do they stand up as being the sharpest? Okay, and we have to think that way because this is a time for judgmental thinking. Uh, it maybe don't sound good, but someone's got to do it, and you are the one. Can this person do what needs to be done? Do they have the smarts to do it? Number two, will they do it? Will they do it? Is the right attitude there? Are they self-motivators? 
will they do it? Have they given you evidence that will they do it? You can ask them, give me some evidence that you can get done what needs to be done, that you will do it. Tell me about some situations where you have motivated yourself to achieve something. Those are kind of uncomfortable questions to ask someone, right? Well, that's the ones that we need to ask. You don't need to be afraid to ask uncomfortable questions. Number three, fit. F-I-T, because someone can do it. Someone maybe will do it. But another factor is, do they fit? Will they get along with the culture of my other employees, with me, with the customers we serve? Do they fit into this puzzle? Because there's just a certain amount of space in that puzzle, and some folks just can't fit into it. Do they have the personality to achieve what your goals are for the job? Notice I said to achieve your goals because you don't need to set that goal and already have a predetermined notion of what this employee is going to need to look like. So hiring that person is the key to finding the right people. Can, will, fit. Say that with me. Can, will, fit. That's the three first important things to remember. Can they do it? Will they do it? And do they fit? Do they fit our culture? Kind of a rule of thumb is you don't want to hire less than the best. You're better off not to hire than to hire less than the best. Experts nationwide and for many years have said that if you're, if you're hiring, do your very best to hire someone that you think that would be in your top three employee uh, categories uh, to be able one of your to be one of your top three people within a six month period. In other words, that you feel like they've either got the credentials, the personality, the fit, and the will, and the ability to be trained in your particular instances within a six month period, and then they would be able to on their own be a top notch employee that you'll be able to delegate about anything you decide to delegate to them. An important rule, you're better off not to hire than to hire less than the best. Okay? So, Norman and I, my bride Norman, I went up to Outback a, a weekend before last. I had dinner with our daughters up there. And I was reminded when we walked in, remember I've already mentioned Outback once tonight, as someone that maintains the high standards of their employees. But when we walked in the outbound up at Smithfield on Interstate 95, about 5.30 in the afternoon, and we walked in, and the line that we had to wait was not too long, but there was a line there. We had to stand up in the waiting area because there were too many people sitting down. And I said, this restaurant must be packed. Well, I looked around, looked over the shoulders, looked over what was going on, and half of the tables in there were empty. There was no one in there, or, or only that restaurant was half full. And that didn't make me happy to sit around and wait. They, weren't, they didn't let us sit down and have some refreshments. <clears throat> so I asked the, the manager came up and was checking on things, and I said, what's going on here? You, you got all of us standing up here, can't even sit down and re relax, and half your tables are empty. And he apologized, and he said, we are waiting to find the right staff folks to bring in to wait on you. We, we're running short on qualified staffing. And that hit me right between the eyes because I teach it, and it brought it home for me. They had rather not hire people who are substandard in their viewpoint than to lose business. So we waited our turn, and we had a great server, and the food was great as always, and we were not disappointed except that we had to wait. So, indeed, that's a good example of what we're talking about tonight. They're not going to hire less than the best. And I think that proved the point. So once you've, uh, once you've kind of got through this uh, concise job description and you've talked to them, is it time to seal the deal with a, per a person? I mean, how much time is it going to take, Steve? I mean, I've talked to them. I, I don't, 
uh, I got a good feel of who they are and such as that. Are, are you ready to are you ready to make the decision? Well, let me tell you, is it time to seal the deal? The answer is heck no. No, there's a lot of real work that needs to be done before you go after the best of the rest. Before you decide that you're going to hire the, just the best person and you're going to take the time to do it, let's talk about that. First of all, does the employee have an in, does the does the applicant have an in, an infectious attitude? Can you find that when someone smiles at you, you just want to smile back? Do you find that it's someone you want to to look at? Their, I'm not talking about their uh, beauty or or handsomeness, but are they exuding a pleasant persona? Is it an infectious attitude that when they smile, you want to smile back? Or they will make people smile. And if you're a grumpy person who don't smile at anyone, then maybe you need to have someone else do the hiring here, because I know some folks like that. They wouldn't recognize infectious if it was growing on their ears. So <laughs> that's hard to say, but we some of us exist like that. And you need someone that's doing these interviews that understand what these things are. So don't have someone that's got the worst attitude in the world to interview your potential employees. Does this person have a, a self-awareness of themselves? Do they feel comfortable in their own skin? I don't know. If you don't know what that means, it's kind of hard for me to explain it, but are they just nervous? Or is there something about them that says, I don't want to be here. I don't like myself. I don't like the place I'm in. I don't like you, but I need a job and I need it bad, please give me a job. I don't feel good about myself. No one who ever comes up to me will feel good about me waiting on them, but, but ma'am, I need a job. Well, you need to move on. The reason they need a job is because smart people like you didn't hire them. Hard to say, you know, but that's kind of the way it comes down, in my opinion, in my opinion. Self-awareness. How do they feel about being in their own skin? Now, does this person that's come to you green right out of high school, maybe didn't graduate from high school, maybe, 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 whatever it is, but do they have any idea what it takes to run a business? Do they have any idea that for you to pay them, they have to earn money for you to pay your bills, for you to cover your overhead, for your company to make some profit and still have some left over for them. Does this person you're talking to have any clue of what it takes to run a business or the cost versus value? I teach that the, uh, one of the main rule, one of the ways that you can do your pricing structures, which we'll talk about next uh, Tuesday night, is that the three times rule. When you're hiring someone and they're asking that you pay them $25 an hour, you need to know that you're going to be able to charge $75 an hour for their service. That will give you $25 to pay them, $25 to cover your overhead, and $25 for profit and taxes. So that's a general rule that you know now that maybe you didn't know before, but does your employee have any idea about how that works? If they're bringing that knowledge with them, with a good understanding about what it takes to keep a business running, man, they go up on the scale. Keep that in mind. Do they have a cost versus value understanding? Do they understand that you have to have cash flow? That, yes, we have to be productive. We have to uh, bill for our time. We have to collect that money. And then you know what? We have to do it over and over and over and over again because cash flow is the lifeblood of my business. And if I have employees that understand that, they'll understand where I'm coming from. If they have no clue about what cash flow is, they can't understand what you're trying to achieve with your plus one management. Can you trust them? Do you feel good about a trusting person? And let me tell you a good way to identify someone that is not a trusted person. A, not, a, a person that generally cannot be trusted is someone that is always accusing someone else. It's someone that's always saying, someone else is telling lies about me. Those are lies. That's fake news. Uh, uh, this is fake. This is that. Uh, I don't trust people. I don't trust anybody. Well, generally, that is the first sign that a narcissist is in the room, 
and it's someone that can't be trusted. So you can pick up. You can pick up those signals as you're interviewing your folks and the way you set up your questions. You need trust. Now, there's such a thing as folks who are con artists. Uh, they're really good at it. But let me tell you what, my friend, entrepreneur, you're getting ready to hire employees. You need to know that you don't need to be conned. That's why that application is important. Those references are important because you're going to do your homework. Papo Stevo here is telling you, do not be conned if you can help it, and sometimes they're going to get you anyway. Sometimes they're, they're pros, they know what they're doing, but generally they're few and far between, especially and will not stand up to a sit-down interview after they've completed a long application. You'll learn to do that. You've got to have someone that's trustworthy. Now in sales, if this person is going to be selling for you, People are not going to buy from someone that they're not satisfied with their trustworthiness. So if this applicant is unable to sell you on their trustworthiness, they will not be able to sell your customer on that and therefore will probably be an awful salesperson who will take your money for a while and then go take someone else's money after you let them go. Trust. Do they have a sense of curiosity? So this is a this is a big one, and maybe you didn't expect this. When you're talking with a possible employee, you want them to ask questions of you. You want them to be curious about what they're getting into here, about what are their potentials, where can they go in this job, what's in it for me. I know what's in it for you. You don't have a successful business and make money, but what's in it for me? Curiosity is a very good plus because someone that has curiosity is willing to listen to other people. They'll have curiosity when they're serving your customer, and they'll do a better job generally. I'm not making I'm making some assumptions here, but in the general run of things, if someone cares about someone else, they ask questions. And I want them to care enough about themselves and their personal dreams to get a good feel for are they wasting their time and their future talking to you about being an, their employer? Do they have genuine brain up here that they're thinking ahead like that? Because that's the employees that you want, those who have some curiosity. How you don't find that out? You've got to ask the hard questions. There's legal complications here, and I'm, I don't, in one of the handouts I don't send to you, we'll give you a lot of information about that. Uh, company policy, uh, uh, do's and don'ts in interviewing, but here's, here's the bottom line. I want you to ask that employee questions that make them squirm, that make them have to think and get out of the box and maybe their comfortable spot. When you see people start shifting around in their chair and and, and shaking, that means you've asked the right kind of questions. And if you want this person to be on board for you for a long time, you want them to be able to stand up to the pressure. Because customers are going to ask them hard questions, and you're going to ask them hard questions. And at some point in time, charisma is going to just fall down and die when it has to stand up to character. And that's what you're after in your interview process. Charisma cannot replace character. And you find out the signals, the little lights on the wheel, on the on the hill, the, the, the stars in their eyes, the smile that comes out when they have a chance to explain to you that there are things that they will do because it's the right things to do, whether anybody is looking or not. That's the person that has character. And that's the person you want to hire because customers will recognize it just like that, and they'll come back to them every time. Ask those questions to find out the hidden personalities that are in there. Now, there's a process that's been used by large industry for a lot of years. It's called the star and parade method of interviews. It's long and deep and very, very into it, but I want to tell you it's good stuff. It's good reading. It's so good for you to have an understanding of it. So in your handout is about Star and Parade Methods. Star and Parade are, are two people's names. And they've been doing this, I think, since the 50s. Uh, it's been perfected. A lot of good reading on the Internet about it. If you're going to hire a lot of people, you need to at least have the knowledge. Give yourself a good 
a couple hour good read and check out the star and uh, parade method of doing interviews. Is the person you're looking at motivated? You know, if someone's going to be motivated, there has to be an assertive person in the room. And assertive is a is a word that's lost in today's world, kind of, uh, especially with young folks. But I want to put it back in here tonight because as a business owner, entrepreneur, and someone who's going to be hiring employees, you need to be assertive. Yeah, you. Because folks are motivated when someone else is assertive. I motivate myself by being assertive on myself. And customers, I motivate them by being assertive with the things that we do and say. Assertive don't mean I'm beating someone up or snapping a bullwhip. It means I have trained and I've learned the right things to say, the right uh, nonverbal communications to send, to move someone along to the place that we want them to be. The old saying from the old, old West in the farms is, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, in the new world of entrepreneurship and Papo Steve is, I'm going to say, not only can you lead them to the water, you can put their head down in it and encourage them to take a sip. By being assertive in the right way, the right training, you can do that. But let me tell you, no matter how assertive you are, when you're not around, that person needs to be motivated by their own energy and desire to, and their own goals. The key word here is to be motivated because of their own energy, desires, and goals and dreams. <laughs> it's a good way to get into this thing, isn't it? Their goals and dreams to move forward and get the job done for you and for themselves. Are they motivated? Can they provide you evidence that they are motivated and have done this in the past to help people? Now, this is a good night on election night, November 8, 2022, to talk about conspiracy theories because let me tell you, the world is full of them, America is full of them, the TV is a full of them, and politics are full of them. And if you now know what a conspiracy theory is, and hopefully you do, and you can tell the difference in them. I want to tell you that when you're hiring people in, in today's world and down the road from here, because this way of thinking is in America, if you've got people that are, it's on their mind about threats and conspiracies here and there, uh, uh, the penuria, uh, 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 insecurity, uh, they're all about uh, fake this and fake that, and the whole world is a bad place because this other group of people are telling lies all the time or stealing elections. Folks that are conspiracy theories, folks, are not the kind of people that are going to make your money. No, because they're going to be the folks that will turn off more than half of your customers once this uh, aura comes out of their way of thinking about not trusting people. Because trust is so important for entrepreneurs to keep and hold customers and employees. So be afraid of these people. Be afraid of people that are, 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 are promoting uh, this narcissistic way of thinking and, 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 and just plain lying and saying, well, you can't prove me different. And uh, you, you, you ask them a question about this, and they say, oh, but how about that? I mean, folks are becoming professional at not answering the question uh, or, or saying why something is or not the truth. Be careful with that. I have to be careful about what I even say about it nowadays. But I can tell you that if an employer, if someone comes to me looking for a job that is all about conspiracy theories, then I'm going to be afraid of them because that's going to leak over into your business and the people they serve and the way they start talking about you and your business. It's just a natural way things that happen. All right, we'll move on from that one. Character, values, and standards. What else has to be said? I said it while the integrity cannot be compromised or, or replaced. What is integrity? That's when someone says, I'm going to do it right whether anyone else is looking at all or even ever knows about it, I've just got my own honor 
and integrity that I'm going to be an honorable person and I'll be able to lay my head down at night and know that I've done the right thing with a good conscience. You know, there are a few people like that around. There's a lot of people like that around. You've got to give them a chance to tell you about it. It's, it's perfectly okay when you're holding an, honor, uh, an interview and, and someone's talking to you about this and that. They, uh, let's say that they, they, they tell you they're proud of that they go to church and they're proud of what they do. It's perfectly okay for you to look at them and say, tell me about your Jesus. Tell me what Jesus means to you. Or maybe they believed in something else and you can say, tell me about so-and-so. Let them talk to you. Find out what's really in there. And when those people know and learn that that is important to you, then you have just gone up on the scale. You, you, you necessarily may not have to pay them as much to make them very happy because they know they're working for a, a, a business owner, entrepreneur, who cares and has the same values they do. And it's the same way with the employees that they're going to meet tomorrow for you too. We've got some folks that can laugh and sing and sell uh, ice cream to Eskimos. I know that. I know that I can sell ice cream to Eskimos, but I don't. Let, I don't want it to have a thing to do with my character because charisma cannot replace character. And you may have someone that may be the hot shot salesman of the world because they got so much charisma. They got such a great hairdo. They have done this and they've done that, and they can tell a great story. But in the long term, a flaw in character will wipe that out and to carry a lot of your business with them and have a lot of disappointing customers. You want to hire the people with integrity and character and be really afraid of someone who has an empty bowl with nothing but charisma in it. Ethics and conduct and trust, very important. Keep that in mind. And I'm here singing this song tonight on my uh, soapbox just down the road somewhere. I'm hoping that when you're interviewing an employee or maybe you are being the person being interviewed, you'll remember this. And you'll say back and you say, hey, I learned the lesson here. I'm going to take the narrow road, the narrow road with integrity and honor. In the long term, it'll pay a great dividend for you. Okay, we've got to hire now. We've got them hired, and what do I say to you? The job has just started. Finding the right person, getting them on board, y'all shaking hands and agreeing on everything we don't get started. You got them on board. So what what is the key now? What is the key now? We got to stay connected. We just don't turn them loose, say sink or swim. We have to stay connected. We have to build a relationship with that person. And you'll learn early on that the closer you can stay with them and talk to them and understand that they need someone to talk to, just like you would if you were new in a job. Those early experiences and challenges will have a lot to do with, with whether they'll stay with you for the long term and become that great employee that you have been after for a long, long time. In one of your drill skills, I, I, I say this to you, and I want you to remember it and be able to say it over and over and over. So someone said it a long time ago, and it's a good thing to remember. People don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And they won't know how much you care unless you create that relationship and stay connected. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Remember that every time you're headed into a conversation with an employee or a customer. So what's it going to take to keep them? What's it going to take to keep them on board? How to keep those employees? First of all, you've got to turn your radar on and tune in to the signals that employees send to you. Are they leaving you for more pay? Are they running away from responsibilities? Are they having a hard time measuring up to uh, a satisfaction level that you're showing to them? You, are you getting, and you can get nonverbal communications from them as to what's on their mind. And if you're sensing that things just aren't right, that the relationship that you have had with them for weeks or months is, seems to be deteriorating, whose responsibility is it to find out? 
I mean, who's got the money invested in the training and introducing this person to your customers? And when they leave you, they're going to take that with them and maybe some of your customers with them. Whose responsibility is it to not let this fester but to jump right on board? It's yours and it's mine to get in touch with that employee to find out what's happening. So what can you do to help your employees? So first of all, I've got to say that, as, as I think the folks that are with us tonight, mostly we're going to say that it is single-person operations. So the employee, there may not be a manager, a manager between you and the employee. Or maybe you're already in a job and you are a manager and employees are between you and, and the boss. So we'll talk about this as if you've got, you're, you're running a manager role here. First of all is a manager has to have the same lesson. So if, if, if you want to encourage someone to be in touch with me and, and take this lesson with us again, fine. That's why we do it. But they need to create that motivating environment. They have to be willing to stand up for the team, to provide coaching, to learn how to delegate, learn how to give extra responsibility to some people, and, and focus on their careers. Learning how to give uh, extra responsibility is different than saying, I don't be a taskmaster and just load you up with more stuff to do. The way that is, is perceived has a lot to do with, with, uh, with how the employee feels about it. If, if they think that you're giving them more work to do just to help you look better, the company to make profit, that's kind of negative. But if they know that you're giving them more responsibility to help them broaden their horizons and become more important to the organization, that's a very positive thing to do. But we have to understand how to create that atmosphere for our employees. We have to know that everyone that's in a job today, if they have dreams, wants to improve wants to do more and make more and, and be more of a person than they are today. So managers have to understand that folks that are working under them want their job. And that manager has to understand that they want to move to a better job as well. Those conversations actually need to be had so that there's a good understanding. It's not things that you're afraid to talk about in a business, however, very few small entrepreneurs will ever have those conversations. Therefore, their employees leave them all the time and go to somewhere they do feel like that their career has a chance to advance. That's what it's all about. So I'll give you 17 ways very quickly here. 17 ways to keep employees. Ready? Share your business visions and goals with them. Once you decide they're going to be an employee, you talk to them honestly about where you want to go and how they can go with you. Create that good environment, a good place to work, a fun place to work where people are honest and they look forward to coming to work in the mornings. It's up to you to do that. Take care of your employees. Take care of them financially. If you've got folks that are working for you, are you paying them what they are worth and deserve? Are you, are you paying what they need to stay? Are they working for you because they just haven't found that other job yet? And sometimes through the years, I would encourage my employees, if, they were, if I was paying them all I could afford to pay them for what they were bringing into my company, I would encourage them to get a second and third job. There's nothing wrong with people having two or three jobs. That is not a, a stain. Let me tell you that I've had two or three jobs since I was 18 years old. So for the four years I was in the Coast Guard, even today I, I do the equivalent of two jobs, and some might even call it three. So I know what it is to work. I know what it is to want to work and to love it. So if you've got a great employee, some way the best way you can help them is to help them find a second job to help them get to their goals and to help them keep them with you as well. Because if you're doing that, they're going to stay with you if you're helping them take care of themselves financially. Acknowledge, number one, good work and hard work. Be willing to tell someone that how much you appreciate them and what a great job they're doing and, and what this customer said about them. Make them feel good about working with you and the fact that you're willing to share 
that good feeling with them. But if you see that hard work, let folks know it and do it immediately. Don't drag it out. Let them know right then. Uh, find out what your the strengths are for someone. What can they do best and see how you can use that strength to help your business grow. Give them plenty of room and elbow room to shine. My, a favorite saying of mine is, you find someone, you hire them, you train them, and then you set them free. You set them free to make money for your business and for them to feel good about making money for your business. So you have to give them the freedom to shine, uh, to let them be the best person they can be. Treat employees the way that you would want to be treated. It's just a golden rule. When you're thinking about making a move related to an employee, think about how you would feel about it if it was coming your way. Always be looking for a better employee that will help you make more money and grow your business. 24-7, the job of recruiting is a 24-7 job. Never, ever stop the opportunity from bringing someone into your organization that can help it grow. I know that sounds maybe strange, but opportunities don't come along often, and opportunities are found more often in people than they are anywhere else. Passion. Yeah, passion. People know how to smile and know how to cry. People that can identify with a customer that walks in with a sad face and a happy face. You want folks that got a heart, and when you can find those folks, you figure out a way to hang on to them. Are they fit for the job? Remember what the, the uh, can, will fit. Are these people going to fit your environment? Are they self-motivators? Are they self-starters? Can you be gone for two weeks and these people will recognize that something needs to be done and go ahead and get it started? That's the folks that you want to stay with, right? And you'll ask them in that application, give me some evidence of how you are a self-starter. If they don't have any evidence, then they're not a self-starter. If they are self-starters, they, they will know how to answer the question. you got to remember that every day is a, is a challenge. There's a drama there in your life, and every employee is like the same thing. And these company, these company goals that you have, uh, the, the requirements that we have to stay in business, the customer expectations, they're hard and they're fast and they're constant. But let me tell you, your employees are dealing with day-to-day -day problems just like you do, and sometimes we have to make exceptions. Sometimes we have to back them up and give them the room to take care of what has to be done at home. And they got to know that you're supporting them in that and feel good about it. And you know what? They will stay with you forever. They will appreciate it because so many entrepreneur employers don't understand how important that is. If you see leadership in, a, in an applicant, you need to figure out a way if you can use them because leadership makes the world go forward. Leadership brings in more sales and greater profits and more opportunity. And you can't have all the leadership that's needed in a business. And if you think that you are, you're a narcissist. You want to make room for other people to share leadership abilities with you so that the team can move forward. The team can go a whole lot further than just you can. Got to remember that. Here's a fact. People very, very seldom quit a job. Oftentimes, all the time, people quit their boss. So the leaders that you have are the ones that will not be quit. The bosses that you are and that you hire in the future are the folks that will run good employees away. Keep in mind, you may be the boss today. You may own the company today. You may be headed to a, a higher expectation than you ever thought you would be, but you've got to keep in mind, we cannot uh, Im improve our situation by walking on the back of our employees. They lift us up. We can't walk on their back. Be the leader that they want to follow. The drill skill, that one of the drill skills is always remember, People quit a job, but uh, very seldom quit a job, but oftentimes quit their boss. Now, every now and then on a calendar, maybe at least once a year, you need to have that one-on-one -on -one session with every, with each and every employee 
and I like to call it a stay in review. Uh, let's talk about how things are going. How do you feel about it? Where are we headed? What suggestions would you have for me? Uh, what do you think of your manager? Uh, how can you see the company growing? What are the mistakes that we're making? Have that stay in review so that the employee knows that they are an important part of the future of your business. Have that stay in review so that the employee knows that they've got a future with you and that you care about it. Have that stay in review so that they know you know what their dreams are and they know what your dreams are. Be the wind beneath their wings for some time. No one has all, this, all the support that they need. And no support is any more important to an employee than knowing that their employer is proud of them and feels good about them and lifts them up with a good, gentle, warm breeze and helps them soar every time that we can. Not soar like you got a sore back. Help you soar like an eagle. And when you have that feeling and employees have that feeling about where they work and it's a family that helps each other, that's a good place to be. I have employees that come to me that work with me for 25 to 40 years. As a matter of fact, I still have one employee left, and she's been with me for almost 50 years. When I sold my businesses 15 years ago, uh, I think at the time we had approximately 17 employees, and the average time on board with us was 25 years. That was the average. Almost every one of them had been somewhere and came back. Our atmosphere, and we worked at it, me and every employee that worked, with, worked really hard to create a, a business family that cared about each other. And it was really tough when one of them left us for one reason or another. And sometimes I would encourage them to leave. If they had an opportunity that was better than what I could offer to them, I wanted them to be, have the best life they could. But for some strange reason, they almost always came back. Sure did. And even those that didn't, I don't have a single employee that worked for me or my father starting in 1959 that we don't have a good relationship with as long as they lived. Also, I'll share with you that having that kind of relationship with those employees ex expand out to all the people they know who, who may be potential customers. It's a good thing to do for business in general. Care enough to be the wing beneath those wings for your employees. Tell the world every time you get a chance about how proud you are of your team. Let folks know that this is the greatest group of employees that I've ever had. We make a great team. Well, we make some mistakes and we drop the ball sometimes. Things happen. They just do. But all in all, I'm so happy with everyone that we work with and we work together as a team and care about each other's families. Tell the world that, and the world will come to your door because that's the kind of businesses they want to do business with. When did Amazon tell you that? When did Target tell you that? When did Walmart tell you that? Nah. As your entrepreneurial team, you be proud of the people that you work with and make the world know it. Tell the world that you've got the very best group of skills and talents that you can find and as your customers are reminding you of that all the time. Now I want to tell you, number 17, now you're going to keep those employees, become a dream manager. Become a dream manager. So very important. One of your handouts is going to be an employee handbook, a sample one, because for you to have the employees, they need to know where you stand in your business and as you're getting your company up and started. You can use this as an example. It's just something, in my opinion, but it'll surely help you get started uh, doing your own employee hand handout. Let's bring it home here for just a minute. Get a drink of water. Y'all want to take a break for a second? Get you a glass of tea? Uh, let's take a two-minute break here, okay? Uh, Jess, let me ask you to turn your microphone on if it's working and tell me where you're located tonight. And Patrice, do you have a, a microphone working tonight? And Sarita? Well, 
Well, maybe y'all went to take the break. That's just fine. Yep. I do. I have, hey. um, it's working. I'm actually getting ready to be in transit to home. Uh, are you really? All right. <clears throat> did you vote today? I did not. I voted last week. Okay. Good for you. <laughs> good for you. All right. Well, I appreciate you being with us tonight, Patrice, and hope things are going well. Thank you. Yes, sir, they are. All right. Let's talk about managing some dreams. You want to see a dream come true? Well, Patrice has the business to help you have dreams come true. I'll put a little commercial in here for her because she has just started up a travel agency where she is booking uh, people on their dream vacations. Very affordable, very easy to get into. So uh, if you want to uh, go on a short cruise to the Bahamas or all the way to Hawaii or Japan or Australia or or the United Kingdom or even over to the mountains of North Carolina, Patrice can help you have a very pleasant trip and help you get all the arrangements set up and save you a ton of money. So if you have an interest in seeing Patrice, send her a, a message on chat or ask me to get you in touch with her and She'll help you line up a vacation for you and your friends and your family. How's that for a commercial, Patrice? <laughs> Let's talk about managing some dreams. That's a, 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 a blue sky subject, isn't it? Uh, first of all, I want to give credit to the fellow who wrote the Dream Manager book. Mr. Matthew Kelly wrote this book a number of years ago, and it has sold millions and millions and millions. I have bought several of them, uh, probably 20 or so, given some away, uh, uh, ordered them for some other people. And I want to tell you, this book could take you, even a slow reader like me, it's in pretty large print, this little book could take you maybe two or three hours to read, first time. And you know what? After you read it the first time, you are going to want to go back and read it again slowly so you can absorb it so you can absorb what it has to say. Uh, he sold over 50 million copies of these books, and I, I give him 100% credit for giving me the idea to start uh, doing this, uh, him and, and one other person I want to talk about. I want to give special credit to uh, the late who passed away about five years ago, Byron Horn. Byron was raised in Eastover, North Carolina, uh, then uh, went to Texas where he uh followed a career in uh, employee uh, benefits and uh, helping folks find jobs. Uh, just a wonderful individual. And with, he and his wife, Dorothy, uh, lived their adult life in Longview, Texas. He passed away in 2018. Byron was a musician, a friend, a teacher, and uh, a cousin of my wife. And when he was spending some time with us here in North Carolina on vacation, he was telling me, when I asked him what he did, he was telling me that he was uh, working with the Texas Department of Employment, uh, giving dream manager uh, lessons across the state to folks who wanted to uh, participate in dream management work. And that just caught my ear now. I'm telling you, it caught my ear. And uh, I, I said, well, tell me more about it. And he did. And now I'm going to tell you more about it. I want to say to you that that uh, after Byron talked with me and I started sharing this with some of my uh, uh, seminars back then, one of the small business center directors uh, that, that I was working for said in that lesson that night, took notes, uh, wanted a copy of the book, didn't say a thing about it other than, this was, hey, Steve, this was an interesting presentation. And about six weeks later, maybe eight weeks later, I got a personal phone call uh, from this lady who was director of the Small Business Center, and she said, Steve, the Dream Manager uh, program is a life changer for me, and I just wanted to share this with you. I've taken seriously what was said in those lessons, and I talked with my, my family, and I've decided to uh, resign my job. Here is the uh, Small Business Center director, and I'm on uh pursue a dream that I have in being a real estate uh, uh, agent in California. And I have made arrangements to move to, uh, to California. And 
uh, Bel Air, I think, was the place that she was going. No, Santa Monica. I've got a job. My, I have a daughter out there, and I don't go out there and make a life. And I was just shocked, just shocked. Uh, and she put it all on the dream matter. She said she hadn't even thought about it before other than just being a dream. But then she realized that maybe dreams can come true. And uh, she applied the lessons, and they did. Now, this was uh, maybe 17 years ago, and I just this past week heard that maybe uh, she is uh, moving back to North Carolina. Uh, she has some uh, <clears throat> relatives here that need her, and she's the kind of lady that would pull up stakes and do it. But I talked to her several times while she was in California, and she really was so glad that she had made the move for her life experiences. So I know this can make a difference. In my personal life and with some of my children, it's made a world of difference, and I've had no less than a dozen folks tell me that they have applied the dream manager lessons to different aspects of their life and business, and it's made tremendous changes. So let's get into it. There may be something here that you will apply or share with your family that, that will make a major difference. I want to give credits also to my daughter, Dr. Sarah Williams at ECU, uh, Paul uh, Meyer, and Jim uh, Roth who has also uh, picked up some good ideas from things that they have said and done. So what's your dream? What is your dream? What What's it going to take to uh, work with family and friends and coworkers to have a win-win-win concept? Because when you learn to manage your dreams, you'll open the door to a lifetime of continuing achievement. It's just that simple, a lifetime. What is your future? Is it fuzzy? or vivid, or is your future well-defined? Well, all of you ladies are here with us tonight working on where your future is going, and I'm so glad that you are because I think that each and, one, uh, each and every one of you, and I know several of you quite well, uh, there are things here that you're working on, uh, even uh, whether you're owning your own trucking company or not, that you're trying to take the fuzz out of your future and make it better defined. And I'm here to help you tonight with some ideas. So at most, in most works, in most jobs, the businesses fail to help employees cope with the pressures that they have away from business. We feel like, hey, it's all we can do to keep up with the pressures we have here, here at work. So how in the world am I going to care about my employees when they leave work? i got enough to worry about right here. Well, that's an attitude that you can have, or that's an attitude that you can trash can because you can uh, uh, pat your head and chew gum at the same time. And I'll assure you that you can do it, because things will get better when you do. So what happens when a business owner makes a serious effort to help their people become closer together and connected in the business? Well, a lot of entrepreneurs will say, that's bad, because I don't want one person talking to the other. They'll be talking about how much one person makes and what kind of responsibilities they have, and maybe the boss is being nicer to me than they are to them. It's really bad for your employees to have a close-knit attitude. Well, I can identify with some of that. I can identify with how employees will gossip and sometimes carry things to the nth degree, and there can be some negativism there, but overall, what we're talking about here has nothing to do with that and everything to do with finding the very positive ways that it can help because I have experienced it through the years with a, a lot of my own personal employees. When you have a group of people that are helping each other, being the wind beneath their wings, the whole work experience becomes a family situation in a positive way more so than a very competitive employee against each other in the way things that sometimes it can. When you're creating uh, ways to help people see their personal dreams come true, that's a big plus. So Paul Mayer would say, before you can understand and motivate others, first of all, you have to understand and motivate yourself. That's why I got his name in here, because that's a good statement. Before you can understand and motivate and lead others, you must, first of all, Understand, motivate, and lead yourself. How true that is. How true that is. I have to do it every single day. So how many written dreams do you have? Take a deep breath here for a moment. 
And I want to ask you to let yourself dream big. Go for it. Dream big. I'm talking about the bucket list now. Have some big dreams. Without limits, no matter what it costs or distance, dream big. And only share those dreams uh, uh, on the list right now. And it's okay if someone else has mentioned a dream to you for you to take that dream too. You're not taking it away from them. It's just going to become your dream as well. And then to kind of put in your mind that I'm going to support and encourage other people to see their dreams come true. That's the first tip. Allow yourself to dream big. Now, there's several areas of focus, and you'll enjoy this when you're working on it with your handouts. Uh, if you hadn't got it, I'll be glad to mail it to you. There's several areas of focuses that people can kind of identify with their dreams. They're all listed here from physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, material, adventures, 12 different areas. So the physical would talk about health and running and quit smoking, losing weight, drinking less. Intellectual, maybe going back to school or reading a book every month, learning another language. Emotional, about how to get along better with your spouse or your children or, or, or maybe uh, I want to buy my own home. Or, or I want to get into a relationship, or maybe I want to take my wife to Italy. Character, I want to develop patience. I want to learn to do what I say I'm going to do. I just want to build my own character up. And I want to be respected. I want to, to, to uh, completely be trustworthy. Financial may be that dream you're interested in, and it always creeps into most of the subject. I'm planning on winning the lottery. How about you guys? And when I do, I'm going to pay off all my debts. I might start a college fund for you and I. I'm going to earn right much money each year, and, and uh, I'll probably hire my own financial advisor. Yeah, that's good dreams. Spiritual, I want to learn how to find an inner peace within myself. I want to in, in, enjoy uncertainty sometimes. Or I maybe just want to study the scriptures and be able to memorize some Bible verses that I don't know. Psychological will be how to improve my willpower and overcome uh, fears that I might have. My having an addiction that I, I, I want to kick in the butt. I want to get rid of this addiction. That's a reasonable dream that a lot of us might want to have. Maybe you're an adventurer and you want to go do some visiting around the world. Well, we got Patrice that's going to help us do that. Uh, maybe it's time that you just want to be creative and write that book, play a guitar, uh, Learn how to paint, maybe grow a garden, whatever the creative motives are. Maybe material, get a new car. Uh, I want, I want that, I want that watch that I've waited for for years. I think it'd be cool if I was wearing a Rolex. Uh, uh, I want to own a place on the river. By golly, there's a place down on the Cape Fear River. I want a cabin on, or maybe a White Lake, or maybe at, the, at Emerald Isle or something in the mountains. Uh, I visited Lake Juneau, Alaska a few weeks ago, and. In uh, Waynesville, North Carolina, what a beautiful place to have. A, that would be a dream home on that lake up there. By golly, professional-wise, I want a promotion. I want to build a new product. I want to become number one in my market, the very best I can be. I, hey, I'm getting a wage on me now, and I want to build a legacy. I, I want When the people read my obituary, I want them to read about what a great-grandfather I was, uh, the volunteer work that I did how I help volunteer uh, and donate things to charities that meant a lot to me. A, a legacy is important. So here's your challenge. You ready for it? That was a lot of fast talking, one in, and I know that if I got your attention, you're going to want to get the dream manager. You're going to want to get a copy of the study guide and pursue it. Let me encourage you to do it. It could be a life changer for you and for your children and other folks you love, or of course for your business. The challenge is identify three of your dreams that you would like to achieve during the next year, during the next 12 months, and write them down, just three of them. And then let's write a little plan on what it's going to take to achieve those. You know the difference in a dream and a wish? Well, a wish is just smoke and mirrors. It may or may not happen, like I'm wishing to win the lottery. But a dream is something that if you work at it and some things happen, tangible things happen, that it can come true. And if you write it down and you start making a plan, 
that you're going to do one step at a time, you are on the way to seeing that dream come true. Just like you are on the way to seeing some dream come true because you decided to sign in here tonight. I know you didn't do it just to hear me flap my jaws. You did it here because you're looking for a way to move to a different place than you're at today so that tomorrow will be a better day. And I am so happy that you let me be a part of your journey. That seeing my dream come true is letting me be a part of your journey to get to where your dream is carrying you. But you've got the right to plan. You've got the right to plan. And next, find a partner. And this is so important. You need to find a partner that will share their three dreams with you. And then you all talk about it. Share with how these things may work together what steps you can help them get to and vice versa. Because here's the amazing thing about tonight's lesson. The human being in us will not let us hear somebody else's dreams and what they're trying to achieve without us having a, a feeling of wanting to help them get there. And the very minute that two people start trying to figure out a way to make something happen, the chances are twice as good that it will happen. And if you've got a group of three or four people working the same way that are taking this very seriously and, and meeting uh, on, on a regular schedule to discuss what progress we're making, you will see amazing things happen. An example is that a person called me up uh, several years ago that told me they had, had heard this dream manager stuff, and their dream at the time their dream at the time was to own a camper, that a simple thing. They just wanted to go camping, and they didn't have much money. They had a little budget, but had a big dream. They just wanted to go camping, and they shared that with their group of employees. And a number of months later, a few months, not a lot, but a few months later after they had been in a meeting and they had shared this information, they got a phone call from one of the people that was associated with the group who was in another state riding down the road and saw a camper out beside the road that had a for sale sign on it, pulled in there and got the details, and it was exactly what this person had been looking for and within the budget they could stand, and within two days they had went down there and bought the camper of their dreams and within their budget because they had shared it and another set of eyes was out looking at it and had in their mind that, hey, maybe I can help someone see their dream come true. It's amazing. Sharing with other people your dreams and listening to them puts together a community effort. We hear about the power of prayer when we're, when we're talking about religion and Christianity, how powerful that is, how it can move mountains and heal industries and change attitudes. Well, the power of dream management group action can help other people see dreams come true. Yeah. If you want to pray for something, pray for the dreamers. Now, you're seeing right here, if you've got a group of people and you're the dream manager at your business and you have meeting with your employees or you have a group of employees that are meeting, how this thing can get started and go. Or it might be a Sunday school class or a circle, or just a group of girlfriends that are together, or a group of guys that go camping together, or go fishing, to, to have these dream sessions. Hey, this is not sissy stuff. This is not, oh, fluffy mess. This is real life that can change the world. But you have to, you have to write the list down and then find a partner to share it with. And then next, we need to follow up. At least once a month, have a meeting, have a scheduled breakfast or a meeting at a club somewhere or, or at a restaurant. Everybody pull your list out, go down the line on what's happened since you last talked, share ideas and chat about it. It is fun and it can be so meaningful for you, so meaningful for you. So the challenge here is, is to make it work, is to get started. So I want to say to you, keep dreaming. Take five minutes every week to spend in your dream book. Add dreams all the time. Includes pictures and 
quotes and articles. If you see something about your dream, cut it out and save it. Scrapbook it. Ask your friends and your family uh, to talk about the dreams with you. Find out who can assist you to get here. We can't do it by ourselves. Find out who can assist you. And then what, what makes it happen? What makes it happen for a business now? It just takes a commitment to make it work. Maybe you are already in a business where you've got a, a group of employees that you can do this with, or a group of friends, or a Sarita, I know you're active in your church. Maybe a Sunday school class that might want to do it. Uh, give it a try. Have a chat about it. Have a dream manager come and just tell you about the story, okay? Schedule monthly appointments with every employee and make it happen. When you read the book, the book is about a small business who's having trouble hanging on to their employees. That's all I'm going to tell you. But by the end of a couple hour read, you will see how amazing that it will it will work, how amazing it can work. How can it work in your company? How can you make to help companies have dreams come true? I want to tell you that, that it does work. So the question is, how can you expect an employee of yours to really care about the success of your business, to really care about you seeing your dreams come true? If you don't really care about seeing and helping them see their dreams come true, because when you do, things will change. People will stay with you. They'll want to stay with you. They'll want to stay with you a long, long time. I can share with you, I don't want to get too personal here, but I can share with you that in my little company, and it was a small company, the dream manager theory helped us see some employees own their own home. The first, the first members of their family life history that had ever owned their own home. Yeah, that was their dream. And I have seen two or three of my employees do that. Our little small company saw probably as many as 25 people graduate from college, children of my employees, and a few of the, the employees themselves graduate from college that had never in their family history had ever anyone ever graduated before. I take great pride in that because we have, as a company, as a family of employees, help put together a plan to make that happen. And health-wise, when people were sick, the, the support of filling in and, 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 and offering personal support and backup for people when they had uh, problems that they needed help with from fellow employees and fellow employees who knew other people that they could bring in. It makes it, it, makes it a, uh, a special thing when you own a company when you're the entrepreneur that owns a company where these kind of things are happening and everyone that's associated with it feel really good about, I'm just a member of a great team. Uh, and the dream manager issues, it may not be that you're the quarterback. As owner, you may have a, someone in your organization that becomes the dream manager. That's part of their job is to help the other employees manage their dream books. It's an exciting thing to think about. And Byron Horn, when he told me this story, uh, maybe 15 years ago, I was amazed. And I took these things and put them to work in my company and shared them with some other folks. And I've seen miracles happen. I don't want to call it a miracle. Maybe that's a stretch. But I've seen people's dreams come true. And here's the, the last thing I'll mention. When you get to working on your dream and you start working that way, very seldom will the actual dream that you were working towards will be actually what happens. Because as we start climbing that ladder, we have to make adjustments. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't plan on this being in the way, so you make an adjustment to move over here, but you keep climbing. That's to keep you stay in the game. And I'll bring the word back that I'd love to use so much endurance. You have that endurance to see you through. You have that intestinal fortitude, guts, to see you through. And as long as you keep climbing, 
the dream that you see in reality may not be the same one that you started at when you started up the ladder, but it will be fantastic because it's such a better place than where you were when you started. The only way you're going to see that dream come true is to start climbing. And climbing together with a dream manager type plan makes you get up the, the, the runs a whole lot faster because other people are helping you do it. I believe that. And I'll say tonight, I'm going to say to you, when I say my prayer tonight, I'm going to pray that each and every one of you will consider pursuing being a dream manager for yourself, your family, and your future employees. I feel good about that, and I, I, I'd appreciate y'all joining me in that effort. Next week, we're going to talk about how to set prices on your products and services with plan discounts. I don't say to you, I don't ever want you to give a discount in your business that you didn't plan to give. Then you're going to be able to make a lot of sales and end up with the profits that you need. I'll show you how to do it next week. And then conquering the competition it's just some good tips that have been well proven through the years that won't cost you a penny to implement, but will help you stay on top of your game. I want to remember a little bit about my time at Cape Lookout. I was in the Coast Guard in the 60s, uh, 1966 through 1970, and I spent a couple of years at Cape Lookout down on the North Carolina coast just off Beaufort, North Carolina, in Moorhead City. And one of my jobs was to go up every morning. I was a, I was an engine man, and one of my jobs was to get up early in the morning and climb those stairs to that lighthouse and go up there on top and, and uh, wipe off all the salt off the uh, the lens and the windows of the lighthouse. And, of course, at 23 years old, that was that was a hop, skip, and jump for me. I loved it. And I'd get up there, and after I wiped those lens down, I'd walk around outside, and usually it was around dawn. The sun was just coming up. And the most beautiful views you've ever seen in your life is watching the, the sun rise over the ocean at Cape Lookout, North Carolina, uh, on the Outer Banks. And I sit there, and I did a lot of dreaming. I'm a, I'm a dreamer. I'm a romantic from that standpoint. And uh, I, I can't look at that lighthouse without thinking of all the dreams that I have and how many of them have not come true. But, you know, I've got close to quite a few of them. I worked at it, had a plan. And with that plan, you see things happen. So I would encourage you guys, uh, I can tell that most of you are very young, uh, have a plan. Uh, turn it into something in reality. But uh, think about the lighthouse every time you see one, because one of the dreams that I want all of us to have is to think about what is that dream. Tell me more about it. How can I help you see it come true? When you're saying that to your friends and your family, you're going to enjoy that because you're letting your light shine. When you ask someone else to tell you about their dream, you know who's shining? You are, because you're showing that you care. So I want God to bless you and your family and your business, and I, hopefully he's going to help you see a lot of your dreams come true. I really do. So thank you all for being with us tonight. I invite you to turn your microphones on if you'd like, share any comments that you might have, ask any questions, and uh We'll go from there. Hey, um, this is Tish. Hey, Tish, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Um, the internet service has not been working, and they keep. So, but anyway, I was able to call on the phone, so I wouldn't miss it. Well, I'm but glad I, you did. I do agree with you on the whole dream management that works even if it's just something that you feel is really tiny it's like taking the small steps gets you to the bigger steps and once you build that momentum you, you just keep going that is so true that is so true and and uh momentum is uh is uh important for everyone no doubt about that no doubt about it so i appreciate you watching anyone else have a comment and uh, Tish, I wanted to say it. Well, let's say Tish and uh, Sarita will be sending out our certificates uh, sometime next week. I'm looking forward to get, getting them out, and I appreciate your help with them. Nice. All right. Well, there, no problem. Yeah. 
Okay, <laughs> not a problem, huh? All right, that's good. Heidi, it was mighty good to have you tonight. I hope you enjoyed your first webinar with us. I did, thank you. <laughs> All right, I look forward to sending you information. Looks like several folks have asked for information. And Jess, did you have a comment before we close it down? All right. Okay, everyone, God bless you. Good night. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, helping you set prices and also giving you some good information on how to stay in front of your competition. Y'all have a great week. God bless you. Good night. God bless you.